Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 216, featuring the first installment of a brand new interview series with Mr. Guido Hinkle, one of the masterminds behind the Realms of Arcania series, Planescape Torment, and now Deathfire, Ruins of Nethermore. This is a fantastic looking game. It's got the uh, turn-based combat. You get to create a whole party of characters, and there's a lot of emphasis on story and character development and the entire faction of rats. It's a great, great stuff, and I was really happy to get him on the show to talk about this. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Guido Hinkle. Hey folks, I am here with the great Guido Hinkle. He's one of the co-creators of Deathfire. He's also uh, worked on Planescape Torment, Realms of Arcania, games I'm sure that almost everybody in this audience is uh, very familiar with. How are you doing today, Guido? I'm doing great, and I'm glad to be here. All right, so let's start off by talking about this new Kickstarter that you've launched. It's called Deathfire, Ruins of Nethermore. I'm sure everybody in this audience in particular is going to be very interested to hear more about this game. It's a, it's a CRPG, it lets you create a whole party. It's got a deep character interaction. You really uh, worked hard on the story, and then, most importantly to me, it's got turn-based combat. Now I see you're trying to raise $390,000 for that project. So what, what more can you tell me about Deathfire? Well, at the core, it's really about bringing back the glory days of role-playing for me, uh, which was back in the, during the period when we were making the Realms of Arcania games, as well as the Wizardry games, the Might and Magics and all that. And I feel over the last 10 years or so, role-playing has lost something. Uh, it's become much more action-oriented than it used to be. Many of the games are level grinders. So you're sort of losing the actual role-playing aspects. And back in the days when we made the, ga the games, uh, one of the key components was that we were trying to recreate tabletop settings. You know, it, we wanted to make the games feel like you're in a group playing with other players a real pen and paper role-playing game. And that is exactly what we're trying to do with Deathfire as well. So in order to do that, yeah, we said we're going to have a party. You can create four characters and you can recruit two additional NPCs to the party over the course of the game. There's a whole lot more. So you really have to pick and choose who you're going to uh, allow into your group. On top of that, the turn-based combat was just something that I felt very strongly about from the beginning. Because with many of today's games, when you have real-time combat, I always feel a little bit like the computer is cheating, you know? I'm here, I have to take care of six guys at the same time. I have to, cl to click all over the screen, yet the computer, he just has one opponent perhaps, and you know, he's sitting there just waiting until his cooldown timer goes off, and then bang, you know, he can immediately cast spells, do whatever. So as a player, I always feel at a disadvantage there. And on top of that, it just gives you so little time to strategize, to build a real tactic of what you want to do, because you're walking, you're being attacked, and immediately you have to cower, you know, you have to find some cover to, to not to get destroyed within seconds, literally, you know. So you don't really have a lot of chance and a lot of opportunities to really think about what am I going to do, how am I going to react to this threat. And turn-based combat just solves all that for me and says, okay, I'm giving you the time, sit down, think about what you're facing, and make the right decisions. So I take it you're not a big fan, Guido, of Diablo and games of that sort? You know, I wouldn't say that. I love Diablo. I play Skyrim a lot and all that. So it's not really that. But I play them more as action RPGs, let's call it that, as opposed to real deep role-playing experiences. And I think that's the big difference. I mean, it's the same with the MMOs. You know, I, I played Lord of the Rings Online a lot. And it's fun and it's great. I really enjoy doing that. But it's a very different experience, I think. Now you said that this game is going to be really focused on the role-playing element. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what exactly does that mean to you? What, I mean, to how, me, how's it going to work in terms of interface? Yeah, no, the, the funny thing is when you play uh, a setting with friends, for example, in a group, you always have people really playing out their characters, and they may throw stuff in the ring that you were totally unprepared for. In a computer game, you rarely see that. You know, you have your characters, you control them, and you go through the game. You tell them what to do, and they will just do whatever you tell them. In Planescape, we made the first attempt really to create characters that have personalities. So that, you know, Morty, for example, he was always running his mouth, and, you know, he would get into arguments, these kinds of things. And I love that, and players love that, you know. And we took that concept and said, you know, what if we extrapolate from that? If we really go in and 
add to that, give the characters real character, real personality. So we designed a, a core technology that we call the Psycho Engine. And what it does is it keeps track of everything that's going on in the game, everything of your characters feel and encounter. So uh, just as an example, if you have two characters in your party that come from a polar opposite, they will automatically disagree on a lot of things. As in real life, that will just start to add up and up and up and eventually comes to a head so that they will really get into an argument. One guy will say, you know, shut up, I've had it with you. And the other guy will react to that. Or, you know, depending on their temper at that point in time, they may even, you know, go at each other's throats and start beating each other up. So as the player, you have to be aware of these things. You have to keep an eye on your companions and see what is happening, what's the dynamics between them. And when you recruit new characters to the party as well, you have to really consider how do they fit within the, the dynamics. And if it doesn't work out, you know, you may actually have to take one and say, you know, it might be a better idea if you leave. And, you know, that kind of role playing comes into the game as well. And the same applies to environments, you know, when you walk through the game, through the world, if you take a character who loves the open spaces, who spent a ranger or something like that, who spent his entire life out in the open green, and all of a sudden you throw him in a dank dungeon with low ceilings, everything's confined, he may start to panic. He really, he's really uncomfortable in that. And he will tell you, you know, there will be feedback. He will say, you know, I am not sure if this is the right place for me. And it, again, it may come to a head. It will gradually build. And that's the beauty of the engine, you know, that it keeps track of these things and it just keeps adding and building momentum. And eventually there might be a, a point where he says, you know, guys, I cannot move ahead with this. I'm going to turn around. Or he may say, you know, could somebody hold my hand? You know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's all really about the interaction of the characters and the reaction of the characters to their environments. How is this going to work with creating your own party? I mean, when you create your characters, do you give them personality traits or are you talking more about NPCs that they meet along the way? Uh, it's about your own characters as well. When you create the characters, I mean, we have 34 traits right now. And I say right now because... 34? 34 traits per character. And those traits, you know... You know, even the non-player characters have those same traits. It's not like, you know, the, the NPCs are really just tiny little, uh, uh, tiny little copies of, of what they could be. No, they're really full-blown up characters. And with those 34 traits, we're really able to define those personalities pretty well, especially because we also add disadvantages, which is something that we did in the Realms of Arcania games for the first time. And... That is just opening up the whole bag because there you can define uh, what characters dislike, what problems they have, what little peccadillos they have, you know, if they're afraid of height, if they're afraid of spiders, those sorts of things. And you can use that very well to influence how they react to their environments. Right now, like I said, we have 34 uh, at, uh, of those traits. We may expand on that or we may cut back on them as we play test the game and we see how the balance works out for all of this. And especially with the disabilities, we may expand on them even, you know, because the fun also is when you think of disabilities, initially, the player will think, hey, you know, I'm just going to try to set them all to zero. So they're not disabilities anymore. But I think players will find that it's much more fun to play having them in place because you get much more quirky uh, moments out of it and much more fun encounters and experiences, you know, so that you will actually want to try to have certain extremes in your party that will then help create a richer game. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. A lot of, a lot of times when I play a game like this, I'll just create random characters and not even look at the stats just yeah. so I can, it's kind yeah, of fun exactly. to play with it. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, can you give me a specific example of maybe some of these personality traits and how they would affect a certain situation in the game? I mean, like I say, if you have somebody who is claustrophobic and you take them into a dungeon, you know, that's becoming an issue. It may not initially, you know, as long as there's torchlight everywhere, fair enough, you know, they may be happy to do so, especially in the safety within a group. But if all of a sudden imagine, you know, you're in this dungeon and it, it just gets smaller and smaller and, you know, maybe the path behind you starts collapsing and you don't immediately know how you're going to get out of there, they start to panic and it's a gradual feeling that builds and... Initially, maybe their best friend, you know, in the party may be able to sue them and say, you know, we're all cool. We're going to get out of this. But again, as, as it continues, it may continue to build and eventually the guy may just completely break down. 
That's just one example. The other thing is one key component in the game are undead because it's part of the story. So if somebody is afraid or has a, has a natural fear of death, you know, he will be challenged fighting the undead, you know. And it may be as simple as that he's just reluctant to do it at first, that he freezes up or so. Or it may just be a point that he's going completely nuts, you know, and he's like, oh, you know, I'm running. And he will just leave you, you know, and leave you on your own devices. You know, and those are just two examples. Will there be it's romance? All... Romance as well? <sighs> Perhaps. Char who knows? Characters you know? getting married. Uh, it's it's in... certainly a possibility. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the other real disadvantages that is really cool, I think, is pessimism that we have in there. Because you know, you can build really psychotic characters mm -hmm. that way that see something bad in anything. You know, they look at the wall and say, "This wall is going to collapse." You know, and or he turns around and he looks at the sky and says. Like, there's a thunderstorm coming. We better look for shelter. You know, he may have something to complain constantly. And again, like I say, I think these things just add to the overall game a lot. Well, there are all these uh, dialogue. Will it be voice acted or, or text? Well, un unfortunately, voice acting. There's two re two two problems with voice acting. The first is that you're automatically sort of limited by what you can do because it's it's costing a lot of money to do it's costing a lot of time to do and you can make small changes really quickly because you have to re-record the whole thing and all. I think it's much better to do it either with text or actually graphical in a way that the player can see it as opposed to really hammer him over the head and ride it out but actually create little scenes and sequences where the player can see oh, you know this guy is not happy right now so that's the intention, at least. And with voice acting, we don't have it in our budget right now because it is very expensive, you know. And with our budget, we can't really fit that in right now. It would, it could be a, a, a stretch goal, but and again, it limits the design side as well. So I don't really want to go there. I guess there's. The synthesized voices aren't quite there yet. No, unfortunately not. You know, it's funny that you mention it because it used to be kind of a an interest of mine for, for a long time. I kept, you know, trying to create algorithms that actually would allow you to do synthesized voices and all that. But like you say, it's it's not there. Despite the phone company's efforts, you know, because the major research in that area is actually done by the phone companies, uh, but it's still not there. Well, I was watching the video for the game and I saw some really cool... Uh, Rat-looking people, so... <laughs> yeah. No, no, <laughs> like, no. I mean, how much of the story is completed already? Um, I would say about half. And and the rats are one of the factions in the game. We have a whole bunch of different factions that, you know, have different interests in the game world. And in your success, some of them want you to succeed, others not. And others are just totally oblivious to what's going on. And again, it's one of those things where I feel you can enrich a story a lot by, by putting that in. Because it creates certain dilemmas where the player has to stop and think about what's going on. If you take history, for example, history always changes depending on who tells it. It depends on who, you know, which book you read. History may be presented a little differently. And the same is what we're going to do in the game. Depending on how, who you talk, they will outline events, past events to you in a different way. So there's two different sides to every story, for example. And as the player, you're thrown in the middle of it and you have to decide who do I believe, you know, which nugget of this is true and which part of this is true. And you eventually, you may even have to dig a little deeper, try to find other people who corroborate stories or so, so that you can really make a, uh, an, uh, a decision that is educated. Uh, because some of those factions are very important. You will need to take sides, otherwise you might, may not be able to continue on your quest. And picking, depending on which side you pick, the story will completely change, you know, and we have different endings in the game with little variations on top of that. And the outcome may really be completely different depending on which decision you make. So I really try to create a game where the player has to stop and think once in a while and say, you know, there might be side effects to what I'm doing here. I'm not just running out and just killing everything that moves. Uh, I really part of the overall world. People realize, they recognize me and all that. It's like almost like in real world. There's more to it. There's an emotional uh, layer to it that you have to consider as well. You know, if you kill somebody's mother, they're not going to be too happy about it, you know, and, and that's ca the kind of thing we're going for. Speaking of which, you know, killing the mother and the emotional aspects of the game, that is actually how the whole concept came about. 
<clears throat> because I was thinking about the story where we, well, let me, let me put it this way. The game itself starts out that people are disappearing in the world, in the game world. And to make matters worse, not only do they disappear, they actually come back a little later, a week or two later, only that now they're changed. They are walking dead. They're zombies, essentially. And the emotional dilemma that I wanted to build there is, the, is, is, is revolving around the question, what do you do, for example, if you're facing a zombie that you used to know? So instead of what many of the movies do and, and the TV shows and all that, the zombies in our game are not this anonymous mass of whatever, corpses, you know. We're trying to put personalities and emotions into them and say, okay, what would happen if all of a sudden you ran into your own father as a zombie? What would you do? It's like, you know, have you ever thought about that? It's like, what would your emotional response be to that? Would you just whack him over the head like, like it's, he's nothing? No, I don't think a lot of people could do that. You have an attachment to it. So from that point on, I can use that in a role-playing game and say, okay, let's see what the player does. You know, Is he fast enough to respond? Or will he be so stunned in the, in the first moment that the zombie actually has the edge and will bite him before he could even you know, raise his hand? Or will he be really so cold-blooded that he runs a steel right through his own father without a second thought? And if you take that and put different spins on it in different layers throughout the story, I think you get an experience that will be quite fascinating, to be honest. How do you compare this project to, uh, uh, what is it, Project Eternity and Wasteland 2? You know, I, I don't really know how to draw comparisons there because I think they're very, very different games. I mean, Wasteland, for one, is post-apocalyptic. Wasteland for one is post-apocalyptic, you know, and it's a very different environment. Sure. It's it's a very different engine. It's a very different core behind it. That's a very different design mentality behind it. Uh, and with Project Eternity, I have to be honest, uh, I have been following it too little to really see any parallels because I haven't had the chance or haven't had the time really to dig into what it exactly is they're doing. I know it's using the Infinity Engine, so it's going to be a third-person view, an isometric view and all that, which also creates a very different atmosphere in a game as opposed to the first-person view that we're trying to go for. So I know that Chris Avalon has the same kind of knack that I do with really deep stories and involved characters. And I think, you know, from that aspect, he may go in the same direction. But presentation-wise, and especially scope-wise, I think they're going to be very, very different games, different worlds, different everything, I suppose. And aren't they doing a new Planescape-style game as well? Yes, they do. Are you involved in that at all? No, I'm not at all involved in that. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I was also so occupied with Deathfire at the time that it's... It's it's one of the things that I couldn't pay a whole lot of attention to, unfortunately. But I know you know that Colin is designing the game or is part of the design team on the game, and he's a great designer. You know, he did some fascinating stuff in Planescape when it initially, and I'm pretty sure he comes up with some really weird and wicked stuff for for Torment as well. All right. So last year you did a Kickstarter RPG called Thorvala. Uh, which sadly ended up getting canceled, but that was going to be a 3D isometric top-down style game with a, in a Nordic setting, which I actually thought was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering, what did you learn from that experience, and what are you doing differently this time around? Um, I think the big difference is between Sorvala and Deathfire in terms of Kickstarter is that this time we decided, okay, we will pre create presentable material. I think one of the problems with Sorvala was that there wasn't enough there to show people, to really give them the confidence to back and to jump into the project. So this time we said, we're going to build a prototype, we're going to spend some time developing stuff, flushing it out in more detail, so that we can actually go in front of people and say, here, this is what it is, this is what it looks and feels like. And you can see it, you know, in the pitch video on Kickstarter, we have actually in-game play, you know, uh, footage and all. So you can really get a good sense for what it is we're trying to do. I mean, it's still limited to two environments in the video, but if you, if you look at them, you see, okay, we have the one extreme, which is the dark dungeon, and we have the other extreme, which is an outdoor environment, which almost feels like it's not even grid-based and all that, so it almost feels like an open world. So we try to show these two extremes that people can see, okay, 
anything in between is possible because that's what we're going to do we cover everything in between and we really wanted to make sure people can see that can get a sense of it and you know feast their eyes on it and say yeah i like that you know and the same is true for many of the other aspects of the game as well that it was really important for us to be out there to to convince people and to really show and prove that we have something that we've been working on it that we spent time and thought on it and energy and part of that approach was also for me to uh, to blog about it for the past six or seven months on my blog. Uh, I, I kept this production diary, essentially, where I sort of journaled what we've been doing, what we've been working on, some of the decisions we made, and, you know, just in general, giving people a little insight about what it is we're doing. And I think it helped, you know, just to, to show people, yeah, you know, he's not just coming up with this and then goes on Kickstarter, but, you know, that there's just a lot of work being done already. A lot of investment on our end as well. Because I think with Kickstarter, it's important that people see that you're invested. Because if it feels like you're just throwing it at them without having spent a lot of thought on it, they're responding negatively to it. So we wanted to make sure we inspire and we show that we are completely behind this. Well, how do you feel about the reception so far? You know, the funny thing is the reception has been really great. I mean, the feedback we got is, is tremendous. Everybody uh, that I know, and if you take a look at many of the comments on the Kickstarter or on external websites and all that, it's universally very good. People seem to like what they see and all that. But for some reason, you know, it's still going a little too slow for our taste, you know, because uh, we've been over a week into it. And so far, you know, we're we're below what we need to really complete the funding for this, which is unfortunate. And given the positive response that we had, it's a little bit surprising because the total that we're trying to raise is not all that high. You know, it's three hundred ninety thousand dollars, like you said, and it's not this super triple A budget or anything. You know, yeah, it's not like you're trying to raise what was it a million or yeah. <laughs> three million I mean, or something. You know, I mean, it seems like yeah. a lot. For example, with Thorvala, a million seemed a lot. And uh, granted, you know, it is a lot of money. But the thing is, it was a different scope. It, the game was designed to be a complete game universe, a really big world with a lot of uh, content, and that takes time and you know resources to build. In Deathfire, from the beginning, we decided we're going to scale it down, we're going to keep it smaller so that it becomes more achievable, so we can uh, really set goals that are more realistic and say, we built this, and if we happen to reach stretch goals, we can expand on it. And that was in it from the beginning. We said we, we built this core of it, but we keep it so open that uh, design-wise, and story-wise, and technology-wise, we can easily expand from that. And, you know, that is generally the approach we've taken. What is, you know, to put yourself in the shoes of just a gamer for a minute, you know, and you're, you're looking at your own Kickstarter and you're kind of, uh, you know, maybe. I mean, what do you think you would need to hear yourself before you'd say, okay, yeah, definitely going to, to back this? Uh, you know, I've never really thought about it that way. Uh, I would have to think about the campaigns that I have backed and maybe see what, you know, what is it that triggered that response in me that I say, this is cool, I want to help this project. Uh, it would probably be, gee, you know, I, I really don't know. It's, uh, no, I, what, I really are some other, what are some other Kickstarters you've backed? Well, I backed, for example, Project Eternity. Uh, because it, I know, you know, the guys can do tremendous work and I want to see what they're doing because I am pretty sure I will enjoy playing it. I was backing Steve, uh, uh, Chris Taylor's Wildman, for example, because again, I thought that was a great concept. It was fascinating. And in Wildman, for example, it only took you know, a couple of screenshots to convince me. I looked at it and said, like, yeah, this looks cool. I like the style of it alone enough so that I can commit to it. Um, what else have I been backing? It's a whole bunch of stuff I don't even remember right now. Uh, a lot of it is also some books, some some technology stuff. Uh, but game wise, what else was there? Days of Dawn was like a graphic adventure. Again, it was one of those things. I looked at it and I liked the whimsical style that it had, you know. And I was like, okay, I can see that. This is probably fun to play. So to me, the response many times is very instant. You know, if I see it and I like it, I'm like, yeah, sure. I don't need to know more. You know. In many cases, I don't even watch a Kickstarter video. 
because I, you know, I, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't have the time to watch a lot of videos. And uh, I respond to screenshots a lot. And maybe that's also why in the case of Thrombala, my focus was mostly on screenshots or on still images just to create the atmosphere and to bring that across. But it seems that, you know, the majority of gamers really want to see video. They want to see something move and all. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's a very personal thing. Everybody responds to different things. To re He responds to different things on different levels. Yeah, see, for me, it was the, you had me with the rat faction. Yeah, see? <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Guido Hinkle. A lot of great stuff coming up, including how he got started in programming, Apple II stuff, VIC-20 stuff, Commodore 64, a lot of great stuff, so definitely stay tuned for that. Also, if you want to buy uh, the Realms of Arcania series, it's on GOG. You can get all three games for a little over seven bucks. Just don't forget to use my affiliate link. A little uh, kickback will come my way. Add no extra charge for you. Also, want to thank you very, very, very much. If you have supported this show directly, you can do that by going to matchat.us. Look for the support the show uh, link. You can set up a one-time donation or a subscription, but either way, guys, I really, really appreciate your help. You're keeping this show on the air. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I've got a little number called uh, in honor of uh, Guido. I was looking for German ales. And I found this uh, Schneider Weisse, Schneider Weiss Hefeweizen Hopfen Weiss <laughs> from the Schneider and Brooklyner, or uh, let's see, G. Schneider and Son or John, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but appears to be from Munich. It's 8.2% uh, alcohol by volume, and uh, there's a little story on the back about how they brewed it. So apparently, this is a new sensation. A pale Weissbach, robustly dry hopped with the Halle, Halle Tower Saffir variety grown in the fields near the Schneider Brewery, hoppy, zesty, and supremely refreshing. Well, we will see about that. Anyway, let's get this open and see what the Hopfen Weiss is all about. All right, so I got some of this Hopfen Weiss here in the rather excellent drinking horn. And Usually you can tell if it's going to be good by the smell, and I'm really uh, excited about this because it smells great. I mean, it's got kind of a lemony, citrusy, orangey type aroma going here. You almost want to dip some fingers in here and, you know, put it on as cologne. Uh, just really, really nice uh, smell to it. Anyway, let's give it a taste. A lot of flavor in this. Sort of a sweet, uh, citrusy, a little bit of bitterness. Um, you get that sort of strong wheat flavor that you'd expect in a good Hefeweiz or Hefeweizen. Uh, one of my favorite varieties, by the way. Uh, this one just really, really nice. It's rich, creamy, smooth. There's no uh, sort of kick of a, you know, an alcohol taste, anything like that. Just a really smooth uh, beverage. I'm going to try it again. Yeah, I just have no complaints about this at all. Uh, sort of complicated flavor. I'm trying to imagine what that uh, tastes like. It's a little bit of a... Uh, I'm going to have to taste it one more time to try to <laughs> figure out what to call that. There's definitely kind of a, a lemony, kind of rind, orange rind uh, like uh, flavor to this. Maybe uh, orange peel, that sort of thing. <clears throat> very, very nice though. Uh, the flavor is good without being overpowering or anything like that. It's just are really really nice. I'm gonna go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Highly recommend it. Um, Hopfen Weiss, uh, Schneider Weiss, Hefeweizen, uh, definitely right on up there. A uh, full five out of five drinking horns on that for sure. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the again, I was looking for Germans to quote. And I found a good one from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. It goes something like this: Ignorant men raise questions that wise men answered a thousand years ago. I think that applies very well to game development. See you guys next week. You know, we uh, in Atari uh, believe very much that we are manufacturing products for personal use. We call it personal computers. When I started the personal computer business in 1976, we call it a personal computer, and I'm still continuing. 
Now it's up to the individual where he wants to carry this computer to. Mm -hmm. He can never do this in his home, and he can never do this office, he can never do it in the lab, anywhere. But it's up to him. I do not dictate to him where he's going to take it to.